colección de eh, Essential Ivory Press eh, nació este año con la publicación del libro de, eh, que comisionamos a Juan Cruz para que realizase las entrevistas de los que considerábamos son los eh, editores legendarios y que nos dieran su visión de qué es lo que ocurre y ocurrirá con el mundo editorial. Uh, la, el segundo libro que publica esta colección es un libro dedicado a la arquitectura y a su, y a su porqué y, y todo el equipo editorial de Ivory Press pensó que Paul Golver sería la, el escritor clave para inaugurar las, los escritos que posteriormente en los siguientes años se publicarán sobre arquitectura. Esta colección estará centrada en arquitectura, en diseño, en edición y en arte contemporáneo. Paul Goldberg es, eh, además de tener una carrera extraordinaria y prestigiosa dentro del periodismo, empezando eh, en los 70 como jefe de edición de New York Times eh, y ganando el premio Pulitzer en el año 84, eh, que como ustedes saben son, es el premio a la más alta distinción que existe entre el periodismo estadounidense. Eh, desde el año 97, 97 ha sido el crítico de arquitectura del New Yorker hasta este año que comienza su andadura dentro de la publicación que pertenece al, al mismo grupo, eh, Vanity Fair. Ha publicado numerosos libros sobre arquitectura, pero sobre todo su voz es escuchada uh, desde todos los puntos ¿no? de, de la arquitectura y, y, um, y, y pensamos que que este libro será un punto de referencia para los, no solamente los estudiantes de arquitectura, sino también para los profesionales eh, de, de, la, de la disciplina. Eh, ha, sido, ha recibido la medalla del Instituto Norteamericano de Arquitectos y también la medalla del presidente de la Sociedad Artística de Nueva York y el premio, prestigioso premio Pisen Scully del Museo Nacional de Construcción de Washington. Pero, Paul ha tenido la enorme deferencia de viajar desde Nueva York a Madrid para presentar este libro y eh, a Ivory Press le quiero agradecer enormemente su presencia en esta visita rápida y veloz de menos de 24 horas a Madrid, a Madrid y a Europa, a, con su mujer, que también agradecemos su presencia. Y tenemos también con nosotros a, a Norman Foster, eh, que como arquitecto pensamos sería un, un, un gran acompañante en esta presentación, a, al igual que Luis Fernández Galeano, que, al que Ivory Press le está eternamente agradecido por su apoyo y su, eh, su consejo desde que comenzamos en el año 1998, y sobre todo en los ciclos de arquitectura, eh, que con esta será la cuarta exposición que hacemos en el mes de septiembre, Uh, por, su, por su constante apoyo, consejo y también presencia um, y que será el encargado de llevar esta presentación con, con el señor Golver. Tienes la palabra. Muchas gracias, Elena, por tus comentarios tan generosos para conmigo y tan agudos respecto a, a Paul Goldberger. Um, now, now we have a, um, a poll between uh, Norman and myself. Uh, Norman and myself thought that we could um, rather sort of uh, fire questions at him and, uh, and try to make things uh, more clear. Once he presents to the audience, um, what, what could be the meaning of your book for the Spanish audience? Considering that uh, it basically, it is uh, originally written for an Anglo-Saxon one. Well, it is originally written for an Anglo-Saxon audience, but never intended to be limited to that. Most of the, the ideas in the book I had hoped would have much broader implications, uh, and it's in fact already been translated into Korean, Chinese, and Portuguese, I believe, be mm. before Spanish. So, uh, although one of the things that I was very grateful for is the Spanish translator is the only one who was thoughtful enough to want to change some examples 
to connect more to Spanish culture than, than I was using. But the fundamental notion of the book, which is that architecture affects us on an emotional and psychological level, and that all of the buildings we live with every day have a profound effect on our lives, uh, not just the great ones or the ambitious ones, but all of them, uh, and the notion that we have both common memories of architecture as a culture and also specific memories of architecture that each of us possess because of our own lives uh, and the architecture we have lived with from childhood. Uh, those ideas are universal, I think, and they, and they can apply in any place in any culture. Most of the examples I gave in the book are indeed uh, American or British because I was most familiar with those places, but in fact, they're not exclusively so. And as I said, I'm, I'm very pleased that the Spanish translation, in fact, does include some Hispanic examples uh, which make the very same points. Uh, and indeed, it would not have been difficult had the translator in Korea been as thoughtful as the translator here to have done the same thing there or with other Asian examples. Uh, perhaps that at some point will be done. Mm. But some, something else that I would like you to develop is uh, you have written in the New York Times and then in New Yorker, which have a very wide readership. Yes. So you do not write just for architects or students of architecture, no. for a very wide Definitely family. not. In fact, yeah. in and this fact, is something I would like to I, 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 In fact, I do not write primarily for architects or students of architecture. I'm very pleased if they read what I write and like it. But in fact, it's important if they, if they don't respect it, then something is wrong. And I've done something wrong if they don't respect it. But they are not the primary audience. The primary audience is uh, intelligent, thoughtful, interested, non-professionals. I try, when I write about architecture, I try to think about what kind of writing I want to read about another field that I'm interested in but do not have professional expertise in, say, writing about film or theater uh, or music, all things that I love and know a little bit about but would never pretend to have serious knowledge about. So, uh, and the hope long, in the long term is that one builds the audience, builds the constituency, you might say, for good what architecture. I, yes, what I found when I read your book, uh, that is a book that is not for architecture, but is also for architects. Yes. It's, it's, it can well, be read for anybody who is, uh, who is uh, sensitive to the environment, is sensitive yeah, yes. to the shape of uh, yes. your, the, the, be, their own horn. Or the, the idea is to help people understand how architecture affects them and how to look at it and mm. appreciate it. Uh, I once said to an architect shortly after it came out, uh, well, you know, this book is not really for you. Uh, this book is for you to buy and give to your clients. So I said, so you should buy 50 copies and give to your clients. Uh, he said, what makes you think I have 50 clients? But, <laughs> sort of, but anyway, uh, so, you know, that is very much the, the, the origins of the book were many, many years ago when um, uh, Jason Epstein, who's a very uh, prominent editor in New York, uh, said to me, you know, one book that I've always admired is a book that was written by the composer Aaron Copland many, many years ago called What to Listen for in Music that was a book for um, serious non-musicians who were thoughtful and wanted more than a very basic introduction, but nevertheless were not professionals and never would be professionals, and what would help them understand a little bit more what Beethoven was trying to do or Mozart was trying to do. And he wrote this book called What to Listen for in Music that I think has been in print for 40 years or something like that. It would be wonderful if this could happen here. He but will. but will. The, his, his idea was that that would be a model, and so that's what we've tried to do. Well, architects normally are, uh, are at ease with their colleagues, but sometimes find difficult to communicate with lay audiences or with yes. clients. And I think that Norman has this experience, probably, of, of trying to translate our, our rather private language 
into words that everybody can uh, understand. I think, I think it is extraordinary that architects kind of lapse into a sort of mm. private language with words which, um, between architects, they believe that everybody must understand. Yes, right, right. And the reality is that very few people understand, unless they've been um, spending a lot of time in the company of architects and somehow um, uh, understood some of these kind of rather mystical words. So I think that um, it's an extraordinary act if you can write in, um, in plain words and convey quite subtle meanings and command the respect of architects and communicate with intelligent people who are not immersed in the kind of linguistic shorthand. Um, but I, I'm, I find myself more and more, I mean, as passionate as an architect about architecture. Um, but um, with the passage of time, I'm, I'm perhaps more and more sensitive to the implication of infrastructure. In other words, mm -hmm. <coughs> the urban glue that binds all the buildings together. I mean, um, when we leave Madrid tomorrow, we'll have quite strong impression of this space, uh, an apartment or a hotel where we spent the night. Um, but the overriding impression will be of the public spaces, yes. the streets, the boulevards, the squares, um, the crossings, how we got from one place to another, the road. Yes. Um, and, and I'm... I'm curious how far you feel in, in terms of the subject, that it's, it is um, completely about architecture, but it's also a much wider picture. Absolutely. <coughs> um, I could not agree more with you, uh, Norman. Uh, in fact, the last chapter of this book, uh, the English title of it is Buildings and the Making of Place. The idea being that the culminating idea is, in fact, that many buildings come together to create, a, the whole is larger than the sum of its parts, that buildings together create wholes that single buildings, no matter how good they may be, cannot create, mm. and that urban fabric is itself a critical value. Uh, one feels it here in Madrid passionately and, and profoundly, I think, um, but in all good cities, and in fact, uh, I, I once said, uh, I'm not sure this line is in the book, but it may be uh, something that is heresy among architects, perhaps, which is that uh, in a city, the street is more important than the building. I mean, I, 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 you, you I cannot have a good city without good streets. <laughs> and you can actually have a good city with average buildings and great streets. Mm. Although it's better if it has more than that, but whereas if, if you ha do not have great streets, you cannot have a city that, that mm. has that urban energy and excitement that we all value so much. And you could say that one of the failures of modern architecture, when it has the opportunity to go beyond the individual building, yes. is its difficulty in terms of creating memorable spaces. Um, memorable public spaces, mm, and urban spaces, yes. 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 Interior spaces, I think, <coughs> yes. is always sure, sure. created That's very well. But, the private world. But, yes, but uh, no, I think, in fact, the great failing of modern architecture was in its inability to create an urbanism, really. Um, it, it, throughout all periods of modernism, it has created great single buildings, even even during the much maligned 60s and 70s, mm. there were a number of important and good buildings, but there was no understanding of urban space, no understanding of the public realm, no understanding of the value of the street, and that buildings owed something to this larger idea. I think today, though, that, that's uh, more commonly felt, I think. Um, and I think there's also much more of an understanding today that um, one can respect context without directly mimicking it or imitating it. That in fact there are many ways to respect mm. context. You've shown that very much in a lot of the historic work you've done with, com with co combining old and new things in a way that's enormously respectful but never ever descends to imitation, mm. let's say. Mm. So, um, 
But, 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 but of course, yeah, you, yeah. you have been a great supporter of the new urbanists. Uh, I, I'm a, I, no, I'm not an unqualified supporter of the new urbanists. No, I've been positive to some extent because I do believe that they, for a while, were the only people representing the values that we've just talked about. Um, and in fact, I think the new urbanists helped to change the mind of many modernists and make them more aware of this. But I've never um, supported them uncritically. I've always been critical of the, how close new urbanism is to a kind of sentimental historicism and how it has sometimes fallen over the edge into that. The best thing about uh, seaside Florida, though, you know, the sort of mother church of new urbanism, we might say, is that its code is all about streets and building size and relationships, not about style. And in fact, one can fulfill the code and build a modern building. And Stephen Hall and Walter Chatham and a couple of other architects have done that there. Uh, it sometimes annoys people when I say those are my favorite buildings at Seaside, but they are because they, they prove that new urbanism is not just about style. The part of it that is about style, I really am much more critical of. Uh, so. um, I mentioned that not only because of your uh, references to urban continuity, yes. mm -hmm. but also uh, because they, they were, well, they started in Yale. And this yes. is a university you owe very much to. And of course, yes, and it's also as, the as alma mater it, Norman Foster, of Norman, and, Norman and Elena have, created, think, although, have although, created a chair. Although I have seen you many times since then. The last time you and I appeared at a podium together, I think, was at Yale at, the, um, at the, those events celebrating mm. the, the uh, reopening of the Paul Rudolph yeah. building. Yes. Uh, yeah. So, yes. so and, and of course, besides being uh, also, as I said, Norman Salmo, Alma mater, uh, Norman and Elena have created a chair in Yale yes. University, and you sprinkle your text with references to authors and, and the characters of Yale. So I, m maybe can you explain how important Yale has been for your... Um... Yeah, Yale was very important for me um, in a way that perhaps was, made, was slightly different from the way in which it was, it was important to you, because I was studying architectural history uh, with Vincent Scully. I was not studying architecture under Paul Rudolph, as you were. But one of the reasons I wanted to go to Yale was that it was filled with all these important modern buildings that I had been reading about, the art gallery by Louis Kahn, the uh, art and architecture building by Paul Rudolph, uh, Philip Johnson's biology tower, and, and others. Uh, Euro Saarinen, of course, the hockey rink and the building in which I ended up living uh, some years later. Um, and then when I arrived there and began to live there, um, I discovered to my surprise that, well, I did like them indeed. I liked them as much as I had hoped to. But there were also all these funny little Gothic buildings and Georgian buildings there that were historically imitative, that violated all of the uh, modern credo that the others represented, uh, that all the architects hated and disdained. And I and they were very and livable. they were very livable and very nice Absolutely. and very attractive, <clears throat> and so I had a great sort of crise de conscience. You know, how how can these be okay if they violate all the principles? Um, and coming to terms with that, and deciding that it is okay to like many different kinds of architecture that represent different value systems, and realizing that to return to a point we were, that you raised just a moment ago, um, that those buildings were exceptionally strong urbanistically. Absolutely. And, and that was part of their of great, great sense of identity, great sense of continuity, and the streetscape, and, and public space, and so forth. So uh, recognizing all that was a very important part of my own education. Uh, and uh, Vincent Scully, who was my mentor uh, at Yale, and an important architectural historian to so many people, uh, was it at that moment just beginning to come around to accepting these himself, having been a very ideological modernist for a long time, and then as he tended to do, of course, uh, be almost too 
uh, too obsessively in one side and then throw it off and go all the way to the other side. So then he became, I think, too disrespectful of, of much of modernism's achievement. But, uh, and, and that's a separate story. So. How do you yourself feel about post-Gothic, Norman? Well, Yale, um, I got a fellowship which um, I could take at Yale or Harvard. And, um, you made the right choice. Thank you. I, <laughs> I don't regret it either. So. Um, but I, I, I had very, very specific reasons for choosing Yale. And one of them was exactly as you say. It was um, an incredible, um, uh, how can I say, outburst of modern building. Yes, yes. <clears throat> and, um, and one lived that. So um, in this rather quaint, which it must have happened um, at the turn of the 20th yes, century, yes. all these kind of mock medieval buildings yes, had yes. been created, which had, I mean, they worked just fantastically. Right. The squares were a real sense of enclosure. Um, and, um, and Rudolf was the other reason which expanded. I mean, Rudolf, who was taught by Gropius. So in a way, you were mm -hmm. getting the bar house mm -hmm. second hand. Yes. So to get the best of Europe, you were going to America. Um, and, um, and, then, and, and Rudolf was the individual who, if you were working on a design, if you didn't have a drawing or a model, there was absolutely nothing to talk about. Shemayev, who joined, so as students in the master's class, we had half the year with Rudolf, half the year with mm. Shemayev. And Shemayev was not interested mm. in a facade or a section. I mean, he might eventually be, but it was really, why are you doing this building anyway? I mean, should you be doing this, this building? I mean, if it was a project for a factory, the first question was, do you really think there should be a factory here? So, um, so it was the polar opposite, and we came with um, with all kinds of European moralistic um, approach to architecture. I remember that we were shocked that uh, Rudolf student housing was from the outside a brick building, but it was actually framed, and the bricks were not load bearing; they were a veneer. So, it was all this rather posturing, which of course Vincent Scully, as, um, as a critic, mm -hmm. was absolutely fantastic. So he could identify Morse College, I think it was the Saarinen, which yes. was in the um, modern reinterpretation right. of a Gothic style, yes. and at the same time um, be explaining um, why his TWA terminal was like an eagle that was about to take off and was entirely appropriate because an airport was about flight. So, um, so people were driving, as it were, buses through our moral um, attitudes right, right, to right. what was honest and what was not honest. And of course, um, and, and on this subject of placemaking, I think that, um, that there's almost a cyclical thing because at the time that those buildings were denying urbanity, as individual buildings, yes. and that had been lost in the modern movement. You had a whole group <coughs> channeled really through the architectural press, through the architectural review, mm -hmm. Ian Nairn, Gordon Cullen, and they were all drawing the qualities of villages and towns and enclosure, um, and when space leaked out and so on. So I think it's this, I, I mean, I think that there is over time a certain maturity Absolutely. in terms of attitudes. Absolutely. Well, even Rudolf himself represented, I think, a much richer view of mm. many of these things than, than others did. And the Art and Architecture building at Yale is a very urbane mm. building, and it really is contextual in a very, mm. very profound how way. Corner. How it turns the corner, how it just continue, how it speaks to the Khan building across mm. the street, and, and, and all of those things. So um, it is remarkable, but... Um, and, and Saarinen himself, of course, who I think was a key figure in the, the end of modernist ideology, in effect. And he was down because, the road. Yes. So he wasn't actually in New Haven. But if you took the road out of New Haven, then... But he did all that work at Yale. But yes. was profoundly oh, yes. important and became you know, justly celebrated, I think. Mm. Uh, although 
uh, in those, <coughs> those years, most of us didn't like it very much. I think we felt it was, I remember thinking the hockey rink was too anti-urban because it was too much of an object of its own and looked so silly beside all those frame houses, which it did. But of course, after 50 years, one is so accustomed to it that it becomes the context. And I think that's it was another fascinating. thing. It was fascinating yeah. mm -hmm. to live these parallel worlds. And, um, and so you were, you were living something that wasn't, I mean, how can I say, in Europe, you could be talking about modern architecture, but it wouldn't be part of your life. You wouldn't be seeing it. Yes. You, wouldn't be, you wouldn't have that contact with it. I remember that um, the, the architecture faculty had not moved into the architecture building and occupied the top floor of Lou Kahn's museum. So you walked in in the morning to the elevator and you contemplated Van Gogh, um, all the kind of modern masters of painting and sculpture whilst you were waiting to ascend to the top. And of course, these were just great loft spaces. Yes. It was um, absolute magic, magic time. I think this, this eclecticism that we mm -hmm. reached uh, through this, uh, well, reconciliation with this neo-Gothic uh, landscape um, has made you praise in the same book, the Harkness Tower and the CCTV Tower. Yes, you know, that, you're absolutely right. Which, which uh, I, I think no, no other living critic has uh, well, <laughs> praised it, them both the same. It's certainly maybe the only book that between the two, <laughs> two covers praises both the Harkness Tower, which is famously neo-Gothic and, of course, CCTV by Rem Koolhaas, which everyone knows. Um, well, they are different buildings for different situations and different places and different times, and they're each appropriate to what they are. Do you, do and, you feel yes. you could have written this book, say, in the form that it is 10, 15, 20 years ago? Or? Uh, no, and I do not feel I could have written it in this form 10 or 15 or 20 years ago. And I have absolute proof for that, which is that I tried, actually. <laughs> yeah, this, look, I tried. Uh, the conversation that Jason Epstein had with me about the Aaron Copeland book actually took place in the 80s. Uh, sometimes books take longer than buildings. We hope they don't, but some of them do. And I started it, and in fact, Maybe the time wasn't right, maybe I was not, my head wasn't in the right place for it, I don't know. All I know is I made very little progress and ended up putting it in a drawer. Those were the days before even things were electronic. And coming back to it a few years later, putting it away again, writing other books in between, happily, I was not too lazy, but not finished. And then it was not until um, a few years ago that uh, the Yale Press asked me to do uh, a similar book, and I said I just happened to have a half-finished beginning of that book, <laughs> and, and, and I took it out and did, but so I did indeed try and, and failed, so. Yes, I mean, I think mm -hmm. that, that, that in a way what I'm, what I'm getting at is that um, I, I think that in individuals there is a certain maturity in terms of coming to grips yes. with some of the fundamentals that bypass style and, and in a way um, can embrace buildings which one might have been savagely critical of yes. not so long ago. I mean, you're, you're absolutely right, absolutely right. In fact, if there's anything that those uh, pseudo-Gothic buildings or fake Gothic buildings we're talking about taught me, uh, and I should say the best line about those buildings at Yale uh, I cannot claim was my own. Somebody once described them as looking like uh, a Broadway stage set for a musical set at Oxford. <laughs> but um, in any event, uh, the most important thing that they taught me was that form and scale and materials and light uh, are all more important than Style. Style is the least important thing of all, really, and that uh, one can handle those fundamental things about scale and materials and light and space and plan and so forth and so on, uh, well or badly in different styles. And, and that's, not the, that's not the point particularly. So anyway, so I mean, that, that was for me the lesson, and I think 
it does, one does have to be at a certain point in one's life before one can kind of feel all that fully. One of your favorite buildings is New York Public Library. Yes. That you mention often with great praise. Uh, who is now in the hands of Norman. Yeah, so you have more, Norman, more, yes, more yes. point of contact. Yes, yes. We, uh, we've spoken about it. And uh, I know Norman is now at work on the final version of the plan mm -hmm. that has not yet been made public. So um, I have many good friends at the library, but they have not let me see <laughs> wherever you are. So I can, uh, although I'm assured that nothing is dramatically different from earlier versions. Uh, I think it's a very exciting project, in fact, actually. And, and the, uh, uh, I mean, the, the Carrere and Hastings building that is the New York Public Library, I think, is one of the, the great public buildings of America, not just of New York. Uh, and again, a place in which uh, the, the Beaux-Arts style of the building is transcended by many things about it. And, and it, uh, it's a, an extraordinary thing. Um, and the decision to carve out one enormous section of, it, of its interior and redo it, have, have Norman redo it uh, in a modern way, is not one that was taken lightly at all by the library, but I think it, it, it is justifiable uh, given all of the various programmatic circumstances that they are, they are dealing with. Um, I mean, I, I have... Uh, I've been a supporter of the project for a while, but uh, one of the things that has led me to uh, feel even more firmly uh, that it's the right thing to do, and I should say, without digressing to talk about this entirely, uh, the New York Public Library has a very famous uh, book storage section, which is seven levels of book stacks that are all of steel and iron work and we're almost like a machine for s delivering books to the grand reading room, which is above them. And uh, that is less and less practical in the age of digitalization, and books are increasingly being used in other ways, uh, and there's a greater and greater demand for public facilities and other library functions. So the notion was to sort of take those books, move them, and create a new public circulate, circulating library below, which, which Foster and Partners will, will be designing. And one of the other reasons is because this, those stacks, it is my understanding they cannot really be properly humidity controlled or temperature controlled. And so amid all of this controversy that's been going on in New York for the last year really, um, people have said, you know, what is best for the architects? What do the librarians want? What do the trustees want? What does the public want? Nobody has said, what is best for the books? What do the books want? And I think the books, in fact, will not fare well if they're kept there forever. So that is what, for me, sort of tips the scales completely. I mean, I, I've been inclined toward the project, as you know, anyway, but uh, that sort of took away the last lingering little bit of sympathy one might have had for the, the contrary argument, let's mm. say. Uh, it's, that, it's, mm -hmm. it's, um, it's, it's, it's been fueled as a controversy by um, an unfortunate gap between directors. And so yes. um, the, the story has somehow got lost in the sense that um, what, what, what nobody is really saying is that there is more public space in a horrible building opposite the New York yes, Public yes. Library, which started life as a department store and is absolutely ghastly. I mean, it, it's like going into a store from before the Berlin Wall fell down right, right. And, and it was just grim, dark, with fluorescent strips. I mean, really, really horrible. And that's the lending library. And so the idea that you look after the books and you take the books out of a space which is not public, right. <clears throat> and you still hold up at the top the unbelievable reading room, which is historic, and you improve, you don't mess around with the, with the route, you, you keep intact the beautiful spaces that lead you there. 
And then you make more accessible from the side street, the cross street, access. And so it's, it's really a great story. But yeah, somehow so. it's, it's all got, got hyped up into an, another kind of story. You know, they don't believe in books anymore. Have you heard it? Yes, they're I taking know, all know. the books away. They're taking um, all the books it's away. It's all going to go electronics. And it's going to be... Um, it's going to be a Starbucks. Yes, the library. You know, it's going to be a Starbucks. The library is turning itself into an internet cafe. Was the rumor all around New York? Yes. Yes. yes, um, yes. Well, for so, the Spanish public, the New York public library is an iconic building. For, for New Yorkers too, for New it Yorkers. is iconic. Yes. Um, and for readers and for Nobel prizes that they wrote their books there, <laughs> and they were completely, completely against. Uh, this project, and they, it has been a polemic for the last one year and a half in all the newspapers, in the New York Review books, in all the uh, intellectual publications yes, yes. against this project because uh, they thought that the books will be destroyed, right. that they will put computers, that the magnificent uh, uh, center of where a lot of uh, uh, iconic uh, novels and essays and and, and, and right. magnificent book were written will disappear, and uh, it, it, but it, no, it's, it's, no, I was going to say it is. I mean, exactly as you're saying, it's an extraordinary institution. It's the New York Public Library, and it's privately funded. It's the New York Public Library, and probably the only reading room in the world where anybody can go. And when I say anybody. Anybody can go. Um, so you've got the homeless in there. It's the most beautiful um, space. It's the most beautiful space. You've got the most serious scholars, researchers, right? scholars. Um, I mean, and it is part of a wider system which is delivering books and education to deprived areas um, in districts of New York and bringing education, enlightenment, access to knowledge to communities where that is, is decried. Um, so in that sense, it's still doing extraordinary missionary work. Yes, oh, absolutely. <coughs> and, uh, you know, I, you know I'm, I'm, I'm writing about this project and the controversy in Vanity Fair next month. And uh, I, at one point in this article, it says, you know, the library did not have an architectural problem, it had a public relations problem, in fact, because I think that, uh, as you say, I mean, there was a tremendous failure to communicate properly the value of the project, in large part because of the transition of directors and board chairmen and so forth. But uh, anyway, that, this is all uh, anyway, my, minor, not, not of necessarily does, great interest. But it does come yes. full mm -hmm. circle, doesn't mm -hmm. it, to the significance of what you're writing in this book, mm -hmm. and that is that it is, um, it's more about clients, patronage, enlightenment, yes. in terms of ensuring that people are aware of the importance of the subject, because architecture is about constant renewal. And it's probably an exaggeration to say it, but I, I, I think we've said it in different ways that, um, that the most Im important person is the client. The client in, is, is the architect in many ways in terms of um, uh, the attitude to the project. I mean, the best clients are immersed in the, I mean, we were just talking about it now. I mean, we we're talking about a, um, a competition which I'm not going to name and you were saying, I really hope that the guy who's in charge is involved himself because it's that important. It's not passing it down the line to a project manager, to somebody who's going to be a bean counter, or uh, not to say that the accounting isn't important along the way. But, um, and, and, and in that sense, coming again full circle to, um, to Scully in Yale, um, far and away the, the greatest influence on, um, on American architecture had to be those young undergraduates who would flock in their hundreds to Scully's lectures on architecture. And in a way, um, he achieved in his medium what you're achieving in your medium, and that is um, 
writing at a level which is serious and significant enough that, like Scully, um, we're all there in the master's class up in the aisles, but the big audience out there are the hundreds of the students who will be commissioning buildings in the future, whether those are hospitals, offices, corporate headquarters, museums, I mean, whatever. Yeah, absolutely, <coughs> I, I, I've often said that uh, whatever Vincent Scully did in his career to educate architects is minor compared to what he has done to educate clients, in mm. fact. And, uh, and as you say, I mean, the, the, the interplay, the relationship between an architect and a client is always critical. Uh, I don't know any architect who does his best work for an inferior client, no, in a way. I mean, the, so right. the best people bring out, encourage you to a dialogue that, yeah. that creates the best work. You know, somebody once asked Louis Kahn if he preferred the kind of client who knew exactly what he wanted and was very specific, or the kind of client who uh, left it all to him and said, no, no, no you, you're the architect, you just do it. And he said, I don't really like either of those two kinds of clients. Um, one is too engaged, the other is not engaged enough. He said, I don't want the client who knows exactly what he wants, I want the client who knows what he aspires to. I thought that was a very beautiful way to put it, actually, the client who knows what he aspires to but then needs the architect to actually give it realization. So, um. uh, the other person that should be sitting here, who is the person who knows the deep guts of this book, um, almost like you, who is your translator, yes. uh, that you referred before, Jorge Sainz, who is here. And I, if you allow me, I would like to ask you uh, how your experience has been translating this monumental, monumental book. And um, constantly I have the feedback from Paul about your questioning every page and almost every paragraph. So I would like that, if it's possible, you share, you share with us. So if you sit, yeah. Oh, no. <coughs> the first thing I must say is that uh, usually translators um, read very well English, write very well Spanish, but we cannot understand the word not spoken English. So it has been a pleasure for me to translate this book. Uh, first, because the author. Secondly, because the editor. And thirdly, because it's a subject in which I am most interested. In fact, uh, I will use this book for my course of introduction to architecture from now on. So the translator, uh, translation has been very interesting, uh, especially when I have had the opportunity to contact by email with the author. Uh, I remember my, my first message began either to suggest you some changes because I was not very sure about the author's attitude. Sometimes the author are very proud about the words, but uh, the first answer was very positive, so I uh, uh, continue to suggest this little, no, no changes, but additions. The additions. Yes. additions. Uh, and well, the, the author has explained it in the, in the note for the Spanish edition. The prologist has mentioned it also, thank you very much. And uh, I'm very proud of this little contribution to the, to the Spanish edition of the book. So thank you very much, everybody. Well, th well thank you. Um, as I, uh, I do not want to be considered one of those authors who is not proud of his words. In fact, I am very proud of my words, but I don't uh, believe that being proud of one's words means one cannot learn from other people how to make them better. And your suggestions were so thoughtful and emerged out of such careful reading, and I felt could actually strengthen it. So I was happy to respond in that way. Uh, 
Oh, I, I, yes, I, I certainly hope it can be used for students everywhere. Yes, that would be wonderful. Um, then I, you know, then I, then I might have an income. I mean, who knows? <laughs> uh, I mean, since, since books like this are not likely to be sold to Hollywood to be made into movies, my only, my only hope is of selling many copies to students and... So do uh, I. <laughs> right. And, uh, and, as I said earlier, you know, and to architects who, uh, uh, if, if every architect bought 50 copies to give to his clients, then we'd be doing fine, <laughs> yes. So, uh, yeah. No, the, the, the book is indeed a labor of love, not only from the part of the author and the translator, but also the editor. I think, I think it's... it's yeah, I think it's a, it's, it's a very seductive object that uh, everybody must buy <laughs> and, uh, of course, present uh, to prospective clients, uh, students, mother, whatever. <laughs> but uh, w w what I find more appealing of this is that it's the second book after one that discussed the, uh, the end of the book, the death of the book. A book... Uh, which was a collection of interviews with editors in which they discuss. Yes. Um, is this an archaic object? Are we sort of looking at the last, uh, you know, the, the, the last gasps of, of, of an adventure which has uh, been with us 500 years? And I think it's interesting that, uh, that Elena, after having this uh, multiple conversation with uh, so many different editors yes. and being an editor herself, has made this the real first, you know, first uh, declaration of love to books and to libraries. Uh, when, uh, the, the, the team of Five Very Press with, with me, we are determined to, to, uh, to demonstrate that the book is extremely alive. In fact, the first edition of uh, the Juan Cruz, the first edition of this, uh, first book of this collection has sold out oh, fantastic. In, in three months and Good. we are now with the second edition so the book is extremely alive when you present that book with love mean, means that the book is not only to read it's only to touch it's, to, it's always to reread it's, always, it's also to smell it's, always, it's also to uh, underwrite so, and it's to revisit and I, uh, this is the reason in this, uh, also this, uh, this collection is thought uh, for books that you can revisit through the time. And you but can... this is more number one, because the other one was not... No, the other one was an introduction. It was an introduction to the series. It yeah. was just a reflection of the book. Yeah. Uh, are, 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 must we edit books? Because still? architecture matters, you see. Exactly. Mm -hmm. and, and then we have number one uh, with... Uh, with uh, why architecture matters, and uh, and of course it must be. I, I think it must be widely praised and widely read, not only by clients mm -hmm. but also by architects, because they they, they may you say in the prologue. Yeah, yeah, yeah. In, in my forward, <coughs> I insist that it should be read by architects too, and of course it's it's, it's great that uh, you have managed to break with this. Uh, uh, lingua, <laughs> private, <laughs> language private language of, of architects and, and speak to wider audiences in the New York Times, then in, in, the, in the New Yorker and now in Vanity Fair. Yeah, yeah. In, well, in, in, in both your previous posts, you replaced Ada Luis Huxtable, Louis Mumford, so you came with very, very big shoes to fill. Yes, yes. Very, no, very, in each case, very challenging. And both people I have learned from, very much from and, and continue to learn very much very much from. Uh, but, well, thank you, thank you very much. I, needless to say, I am deeply grateful for that and uh, happy that you feel architects may buy this book as well. Um, we do not discriminate. We are happy to have anyone purchase this book, of course. But, but um, I'm also grateful to everyone at Ivory Press for uh, creating something that is physically so beautiful. Um, you know, th this is was conceived as a relatively small book and also consciously as different from elaborate coffee table volumes that are large and expensive and um, elaborately produced. It was always intended to be a very simply produced book. And Ivory Press has changed the design, but in a way that's entirely faithful to that original idea of keeping it a simple book, 
but in fact has made it, in, in my view, more elegant than it was before, um, and yet still uh, with that quality of clarity and simplicity. So I'm what, very what pleased. What do you think of it, Norman, as an object? I think it's beautifully tactile. I mean, yeah, I yeah. think it's, mm -hmm. it's really desirable from the cover to... Um, um, well, I would like that I'm if you have any questions, uh, <laughs> no, you can go to the bookshop. Um, <laughs> yes, the who, last question. Who are you replacing in, in, in Vanity Fair? Uh, in Vanity Fair, I'm not actually replacing anybody. Um, uh, Graydon Carter, the editor of Vanity Fair, and I have known each other for a long time. He asked me if I would consider coming there. Uh, because he's quite interested in architecture and design, um, and particularly interested in all the issues that Norman put on the table a few minutes ago about the relationships between architecture and people and politics and money and all of these things and how they impact on design, uh, as well as interested in other things such as graphics and automobile design and product design and, and so forth, which over time I hope to be able to write about. And I had been at The New Yorker for 15 years, which felt like a very nice round number and had a very good time there and collected what I'd written in a book. So it just seemed like a good moment to make a transition. Uh, as, and uh, did you ever meet Louis Manfort? I suppose uh, you did. I did meet him close to the end of his life. Um, he was not... Uh, sort of at his very best at that moment though because he uh, he had a long and slow decline and uh, sadly he was already not you know fully there when when we met nevertheless it was a pleasure to meet him uh, and be in his presence yes because as, um, as you you may not know but now Luis Manfred is um, is being reprinted in Spain. All of ah. his books have been... Uh, oh, how interesting. I'm, yes, I'm, yes. So Luis Manfort is, is having a, a comeback. Uh, uh, Luis Manfort, who... Yeah, different publishers. Different publishers are, are reprinting uh, many of his uh, classical books. From the was cities always and, uh, quite passionate about the relationship between architecture and society, really. But sometimes to the point of perhaps... Uh, not being conscious enough of aesthetics in some cases, but <laughs> nevertheless, uh, there, there's still a great lessons there. Uh, Ada Louise Huxtable, however, you know, is, is now 91. She will be 92 this winter, and is still uh, as sharp as any of us on this yeah. <laughs> podium, and still active. It's really quite wonderful. In fact. Uh, still yeah. writing in the Wall Street. Still Journal. writing in the Wall Street Journal, uh, yeah. not often, but occasionally, and and when she does, very well. Yeah. Yeah. So. Mm. Yes. Okay. So thank, thank, thank you. Yes. All. Thank you. So thank, thank you all for coming. Uh, thank you, Elena, for giving us this wonderful book to touch. <laughs> and thank you, thank Norman, you. Jorge, and Paul for thank being you. this nice Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Good. Thank you.